September 20th uh, meeting of the Board of Education is now called to order. Please rise for the invocation. O oh God, we pray to administer that which is just in all educational policies, being ever mindful of your guidance, stir us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Item 2.03 is approval of the minutes. So oh, Mr. Mr. Grannon? Okay, so you just need to make that in motion form. Uh, yeah. okay. Motion passes 9-0 to amend the minutes. Um, now, we vote to... Right, and there's already been a motion. So there's already been a motion to approve the minutes, so now do um, all those in favor of approving the minutes as amended? All right, motion passes, 9-0. Sorry, people. Okay. Didn't have my mic on. Um, item 2.06 is Educator of the Month, Ms. Sasso. Each year, from September 15 to October 15, Americans observe National Heritage, Hispanic Heritage Month by celebrating the histories, cultures, and contributions of Americans whose ancestors are of Hispanic descent. In honor of this important month, on school calendars especially, the Board of Education would like to recognize a Hispanic educator in our school system whose reputation precedes her. Sally Pasimino Wilson of Tyler Heights Elementary School has certainly made her mark in the short amount of time, just 20 years, she has been on the AACPS team. A product of our great school system, Ms. Wilson has been recognized by the U.S. Department of Education as part of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanics for Outstanding Instructions and Community Collaboration. She has also shared her award-winning approach to teaching on a global scale as a presenter of an international conference for ESOL educators. And most recently, she received the honor of one of being named one of the top five finalists for the AACPS Teacher of the Year at a school where more than 70% of students are English language learning, Ms. Wilson uses her bilingual skill to engage her students and build their confidence. Considering parent involvement as paramount to student success, she strongly encourages parental engagement and advocacy. She can often be seen at Annapolis Education Commission meetings, PTA meetings, Title I extracurricular activities, and parent workshops. Ms. Wilson promotes positive change at Tyler Heights in the various leadership roles she has held. As a member of the Vision Task Force, she worked diligently in developing the school's vision and mission. Together is how we excel. As a valuable member of the school improvement team, she monitored the school's goals and growth through defined action steps. In recent past, 
She has also served as the intermediate lead teacher and third grade team leader. As the school equity liaison, she provides professional development to the staff on growth, mindset, and other strategies to ensure equity for all students. As a leader within her school, her passion drives her work and inspires the work of others. Sally's colleagues regularly seek her guidance and teaching techniques and equitable strategies. I could tell you a lot more about Ms. Wilson, but I'm going to stop here and let some important people, her students, tell you instead. Let's watch the What's video. What's the next thing that we will do to record data? Ms. Wilson is an awesome teacher because she's very nice and compassionate to other students. One really cool thing about Ms. Wilson is she's funny and kind and and helpful to others. Mrs. Wilson makes me smile by saying funny jokes in third grade, and she always makes me smile. She um, does, she teaches really cool things. Sally Wilson, you provide an immeasurable service to the students of Tyler Heights Elementary School. The instruction and assessment of your students being familiar with their cultural backgrounds and the knowledge you share with other classroom teachers are all critical factors in student improvement. The initiative you show in a diverse school system is truly amazing. On behalf of the Board of Education, I am pleased to present you with the Educator of the Month Award for October 2017. Please join me up front. Item um, 2.07 is school and community highlights. Does anyone have any school and community highlights? <laughs> um, a number of us visited schools this week with Dr. Arlotto and other members of the team um, for back to school, and that's always um, a great um, time to see everything. I um, attended, I kicked off September under the lights and went to a Glen Burnie South River football game, um, which is always great to see. And South River won, so go Seahawks. Um, and I also have attended four back to school nights in the past week. And the 
administration at Glen Burnie High School has to be the most fit administration in the school system because of how much they have to walk that building and through all of those things. I got such a workout going to back to school night between all the buildings, so hats off to all of them. And then Mr. Gillen and I um, uh, held a board outreach event in West County in the Laurel area on Saturday, and that was great to meet many of our parents. And I met some staff people who lived in the neighborhood. I met some teachers who came by and talked to us too, so that was a great event. So um, good way to kick off. And then yesterday, Dr. Alato and I um, went to MSDE to, for where our eGate um, schools were recognized. eGate is excellence in gifted and talented education, and we had 10 schools in the count in the state were recognized, and three of them were from Anne Arundel County. So Piney Orchard, Severna Park, and Crofton Elementaries were all recognized, as well as um, the middle school principal of the year, George Lindley, and the assistant middle school assistant, not middle elementary. school, elementary assistant principal of the year, Lori Barnes. And so that was um, great to be there to see them all recognized for all their hard work. So let's see. Item 2.08 is the Crask Report. Good morning, President Hummer, Dr. Arlotto, and other board members. My name is Julia Paola, and I'm a senior at Annapolis High School, and I am the Chief of Staff of the Chesapeake Regional Association of Student Councils. I am pleased to report that Crask is back on our normal routine of Wednesday night meetings here at Central Office. There's no meeting this evening because of Rosh Hashanah, but we are back on next week at 630. So far, the school year attendance has been great. We're seeing a record number of middle school students uh, this year. Younger teenagers are a welcome sight at Crask meetings. We aim to represent the best interests of all students in the county, so the contributions of middle schoolers helps us consider the experience of those who aren't currently in high school. On Friday, September 29th, members of Crask executive staff will be attending the SAD Student Leadership Conference at Anne Arundel Medical Center. We're looking forward to this event for student leaders from various school chapters of Students Against Destructive Decisions. We will be presenting a workshop on legislative advocacy and political change. Historically, Crask and SAD have partnered to help address youth issues relating to substance abuse, traffic safety, and mental health issues. The Office of Student Leadership is currently accepting applications for the Maryland General Assembly PAGE program. Paging is one of the most popular and competitive programs that we offer. Ten students and two alternatives are selected for this program from dozens of 12th grade applicants. The brochure and application materials are available through high school social studies departments, counselors, and on the Crask website at craskonline.blogspot.com. That's all I got. Have a good day. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we will now take a brief recess to, the, to have pictures taken with our Educator of the Month. So we'll be back in just a couple of minutes.
gentlemen. We're now back in session. We've now um, the public comment portion of the meeting. Anyone to speak, wishing to speak on an item not on today's agenda may offer testimony during this public comment portion of the meeting. Speakers will be allotted three minutes each. The board asks that comments remain civil and appropriate for the various audiences that may be watching or viewing this meeting. Student specific and personnel matters are confidential and cannot be discussed in this forum. This time is intended for speakers to voice their opinion and not necessarily as a question and answer period. Speakers may pose questions, but answers will be counted toward the three minute allotment. For the record, please give your name before speaking and handouts should be given to the board assistants. Um, I will, uh, we have one card for today, um, Sarah Lacey. Good morning, Madam President, Mr. Vice President, members of the board, and Dr. Arlotto. Um, this is my first time making a comment before the Board of Education. I'm actually um, only a second year parent uh, in Anne Arundel County Schools, having come from Howard County. Um, my name is Sarah Lacey. I'm here both as a mom and as the president of the Arundel Woods Homeowners Association. Um, Arundel Woods is a relatively newly constructed neighborhood in Jessup. Um, specifically, two of my children attend Jessup Elementary School. Um, rel the reason why I'm here is because we have a very serious and urgent transportation issue that needs to be resolved. All of the parents in the community uh, agree that this needs to be resolved and there's no reason for it not to be resolved. This is basically a tale of two buses. There is one bus um, that is bus 204. Bus 204 is the main um, elementary school bus that serves Arundel Woods. It stops at the intersection of Wigley Avenue and Gable Drive. Um, that intersection, I would ask for someone from the board to ensure that the supervisor of transportation has actually looked at that intersection and Gable Drive going into Arundel Woods Drive. Just yesterday, bus 204, the driver refused to drop off any children in the afternoon because he was uh, 20 minutes early from when the bus had normally been there. No parents had received notice, and so there were no parents at the bus stop. The bus driver did not discharge any of the students and took them back to school. And his reason was because he felt that intersection is an unsafe place for children to wait. And it is an unsafe place for children to wait. There are no lights, there are no sidewalks, there's no designated safe space for them to wait. And the road on Gable Drive, which connects to the Arundel Woods community, is rough because there's a community next door that's being constructed. Um, and it is, there's no sidewalk and there's no safe place for young children to walk 0.6, 6 tenths of a mile from Wigley and Gable intersection down Gable Drive to Arundel Woods Drive. Arundel Woods is a neighborhood that is essentially a loop and buses and moving trucks, big trucks, garbage trucks, recycling trucks, every kind of truck possible, including buses, can come into our neighborhood, ride around the loop, and exit back on Gable Drive. And I said this was a tale of two buses because there is a bus that four times a day is traversing Gable Drive and coming into and out of um, our neighborhood. That's bus 876. And I have looked at all of the policies and regulations of the board that apply to transportation. And as I've gone through them, there is no reasonable explanation left for why we don't have a bus stop in Arundel Woods. This matter is, is urgent and we've been told to wait indefinitely while the developer and the county uh, departments of inspection and permits do what they need to do. But there is no requirement in the regulations that there has to be an actual um, county permit or approval to get a designated bus stop. So. We're asking for action and we want a bus stop tomorrow, but we'll take it within one week or we'll have to do um, more that we shouldn't have to do to get the bus stop. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Patty. I would like to ask Dr. Alada to have staff look into that circumstance. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, as always, and, and because it's our way to not comment, I'm always taking notes and I'll follow up with staff on, on these issues. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. 
All right, we will now move on to the public hearing for the superintendent's um, recommended FY 2019 CIP and capital budget. Um, hold on. Anyone wishing to speak on this item um, may offer to testimony during this time. There will be no public comment on this when we come to this item in the agenda as this is the public hearing time. Speakers will be allotted three minutes each. The board asks that comments remain civil and appropriate for the various audiences that may be watching or viewing this meeting. Students, uh, um, student specific and personnel matters are confidential and cannot be discussed in this forum. This time is intended for speakers to voice their opinion and there will be no question and answer from the board members. Um, for the record, please give your name before speaking. Handouts should be given to the board assistant. And we currently have one person signed up to speak, um, Allison Pickard. Good morning, President Hummer, members of the board, and Dr. Arlotto. My name is Allison Pickard, and I'm the proud parent of three AACPS Awesome students in the Glen Burnie cluster. As you move to vote on the FY19 capital improvement budget today, I would like to share some thoughts with you. Last night at the Richard Henry Lee Elementary School Back to School Night, the school community recognized Judy Van Horn and Melissa Phillips for their volunteer and advocacy work over the last decade. Last spring, the Glen Burnie Rotary Club recognized Kristen Etzel and Judy Van Horn for advocacy work on behalf of their schools as well. Advocates like Van Horn, Etzel, <coughs> Melissa Phillips, Rachel Jennifer, Jennifer Brienza, and countless others, including students, have been working tirelessly in the Glen Burnie and Old Mill school clusters to move their schools forward in this complex process of construction funding. They have sat in this room in their red and blue shirts and gathered crowds at county level hearings as well. However, they've been told the best way to advocate for their school is to become the biggest cheerleader for the schools ahead of them on the list. Really? These advocates are now fighting for much needed school construction renovations that their own children will not even benefit from anymore due to these projects being pushed out farther and farther every year. So with all due respect, I think it's time that we all put on our red and blue and pick up the fight for schools like Richard Henry Lee, Quarterfield Elementary, Rippling Woods, and Old Mill High School. These schools are not only on the top of the current priority list, but have been on the top of priority list since the MGT's first study in 2006. Students and parents in District 2 have watched as other projects get forward funded by the county while their schools are left to languish on the list. In fact, 12 out of the 23 schools on the current priority list are in the Glen Burnie and Old Mill clusters. Families at Richard Henry Lee were finally presented with the revitalization, revitalization plans just this past year. Is their funding safe this year? Will construction really start next fall? Old Mill School construction advocates have watched their funding bounce around in this CIP process from FY18 to 19. It was pushed back to 2021 last year by the county executive, and this year it's back for y'all to vote on for 2020. The land for the new high school has been purchased for a new high school, but when will it be deeded to the school system? You could make a bold move this morning and bring funding back to FY19 for some of these schools, but no, no matter what happens, I would ask each of you to put on your red and blue shirts and become the cheerleaders for these projects. Support them at the state level in October and use your collective advocacy efforts to lobby both the county executive and the county council in spring. Join the Glen Burnie Old Mill Cheerleading Squad. And if the community really wants to recognize and honor these parent student advocates, fund their school construction projects. I can assure you they'd rather suit up in their red and blue shirts for Friday night football games and skip public hearings like these. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pickard. Are there any other um, public comments on the CIP FY29? 2019 CIP. Okay. Public hearing is now closed. 
items 5.01 through 5.03 are consent items, award of contracts. Do I have a motion to bundle the, these and move them from information to action? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Okay, motion passes. We now have an action item. Dr. Arlotto, your recommendation. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> I recommend that the Board of Education approve contracts as listed on today's agenda, 5.01, 5.02, and 5.03. So moved. Okay. Are there any board questions or comments? Okay. Is there any public comment? All right. So um, all those in favor? Motion passes, 9-0. All right, item 6.01 is administrative personnel appointments, and there are no appointments for this meeting. Item 6.02 is the superintendent's recommended FY 2019 capital budget, six-year plan, and state capital improvement plan. This is an action item. Dr. Arlotto, your recommendation. Yes, ma'am. I recommend the Board of Education adopt the FY 2019 capital budget, six-year plan, and state capital improvement plan. Second. All right. Are there any board questions or comments? Mr. Reinhardt. Uh, thank you, President Hummer. Uh, in many of our communities, uh, we have uh, large groups of constituents that are concerned about the proposed alignments for light rail from the, S excuse me, the SC Maglev project. Uh, in particular, uh, some of the proposed alignments include Odenton Elementary School and also a proposed tunnel beneath Linthicum Elementary School. Uh, was any consideration with SC Maglev and those proposed alignments taken into the current uh, CIP proposal? For the record, Alex Shaknovich, none of the current projects uh, impact either of those two schools, so the answer to that is no. However, we continue to monitor the proposed hearings that are going on uh, facilitated by the state, so we're continuing to assess the situation, but there is no cross uh, path between the CIP and those projects. Ms. Corblack. In the CIP FY 2020, um, the grand total of all categories is 141.2 million, which is about 74K less or 74 million less than the year before in 2019. I'm wondering, um, should we be sliding some things from FY 2021, which is $200 million price tag over to 2020 to sort of balance out the figures, perhaps um, specifically the Mountain Road Corridor Elementary School design, since that part of the, the county seems to be burgeoning with growth? Well, that's certainly uh, possible, and the board is certainly at liberty to do that. One of the issues has to do with uh, the compounding effect of, of sliding projects backwards and forwards. Uh, if, you, if you go back to the board budget that was uh, adopted as approved by the County Council this past year, you noted there were a number of projects that were not funded, including, uh, or fully funded, including uh, Edgewater, Kyler, Richard Henry Lee, Quarterfield, uh, Hillsmere, Rippling Woods, et cetera, that are projects that are lined up ahead of the Mountain Road Corridor. So they were zeroed out by the county government's budget. Of course, we're trying to continue to improve on that situation, but uh, there has to be a balancing act between what was approved by the fiscal authorities last year in terms of what they're signaling in the long-term plan and our plan. So there is a potential for some slippage of our 19 request into 20 that would move the FY20 request up. The other issue that we're constrained by is that the county has been aggressively forward funding uh, the capital projects, uh, thankfully much, muchly attributable to their increasing the bond longevity from a, a, up to a 30-year cycle for school construction projects. But the state of Maryland is increasingly becoming in arrears for, um, for their liability towards us. So if you went, went to the last 
page of the capital budget request, which is the one that uh, is speaking to the state request, by moving Mountain Road Corridor forward, we would really be further sort of ballooning up the this request from the state instead of being sort of 67, 67, we'd be up into the you know, 73, $74 million range, and we've only been receiving on the order of about $35 million to date, kind of on, on average over the course of recent times. So by shifting Mountain Road Corridor forward, we would be asking for more than double what we would ordinarily or customarily be accustomed to receiving from the state of Maryland. So I, I think it's absolutely, you know, at the discretion of the board, but I think by pushing it forward, it's going to compound the um, backlog of county funding potentially, and by pushing it forward in the other direction, it will compound the increase of the unfunded liability from the state government to the CIP. So it's really more about balancing the state fund funding than trying to balance the total, grand total. Correct. Because we're, ca you know, again, we are in catch up mode. Uh, because of our aggressive forward funding on the county side, and thankfully so. These projects that we're under construction right now, you know, wouldn't even be going had it not been for the county to forward fund it. But at some point in time, that's going to stretch the capacity of the county to continue to do that. We've got to sort of let the state catch back up with us so that the county then is positioned to forward fund again. It's it's more of a liquidity question is the way I'm I'm sort of couching it, madam. Mr. Grannon. Is it, is it possible to estimate the uh, financial impact on a project um, of the requirement that a um, prevailing wage has to be paid as part of the construction? So we've been tracking that as well as officials uh, affiliated with the state, and we're seeing, uh, for budgetary purposes, we're seeing about a 13.6, 13.65 percent uh, factor that could be attributable to that phenomenon. When you say you've been tracking that, is that is that something that is uh, publicly available? And where I'm going with this, let me try to give the explanation for the question, is. I guess, as I understand it, that's a state law, but if the public is going to be able to um, make their views known, whether they think that's a good idea or not, to, to their uh, elected representatives, they need to see the deltas. And I'm wondering, um, is that kind of done on a more informal basis? Would there be a, a formal way that an estimate could be um, assigned to a specific project to say, this elementary school that we're proposing is going to cost $50 million if we did not have the prevailing wage requirement, and we're not saying whether we should or should not have it, we're just giving the public the information. If we did not have that, we estimate it would actually only cost whatever 50 million is minus 13.6, I don't know, 45 million, 43 million. Is that something that we could do per project? So many of the uh, jurisdictions, including Anne Arundel County, have been doing what's called side by side bidding, which is bidding the same project. Uh, same set of plans, same set of specifications, and asking the contractors to bid it both ways with prevailing wage and without prevailing wage. Uh, the state of Maryland has asked that we furnish those numbers to them, the public school construction program up in the MSDE building. So the best source of that information on a, on a global basis would be to, for a constituent to ask it of MSDE because they are collecting it not just from Anne Arundel County, but their data set is more robust than ours. We've got a micro view on the impact here locally. Uh, the state's been collecting it from various jurisdictions and sort of has a running tally of the differential between bidding it in both directions. Uh, so that would be probably the best information source if somebody was to make a, essentially a, 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 a pitch to the General Assembly to reconsider that piece of legislation. Okay, I just want to make sure I understood the answer. So do we do that? Then side-by-side side bidding we for all the projects? We do that here in Anne Arundel, as do other counties. And again, that information then that's, uh, that's captured in the bids, and it's been a part of the different contracts. This board has voted on contracts that have been bid both ways. So that information is publicly available here uh, locally. But we've all been, at the request of the state, we've all been remitting that information to them in Baltimore, and they've been aggregating it from all 24 of us, or at least those that have had 
uh, applicable projects since that law came to fruition in 2015. Okay, last follow-up then. Is there something that we could do? I, I guess what you're saying is that's all collected and um, held at MSDE and that the public could go there and get it, but you know that, that's a lot for a regular citizen to do. Is there something that we could do to make those make that delta a little bit more front and center? Again, not weighing in on whether it's you know good as a policy matter or not, but just to make the information available to, for example, the people that come to these meetings as this as this budget goes through the process. Certainly, if anybody you know asks us for the information, we would reach out to the state and be able to get that uh, on their behalf, so that they weren't shopping around you know various parts of the state agency. I mean, we know the information here locally. We don't know what the information is. Uh, on a more broad basis um, as the states goes through its budgetary process this upcoming year uh, I would suspect that their data set has been enriched yet further by real live bids that have occurred in the last 12 months so uh, we'll probably be able to get more real-time information out of the state as we go through their process in the months ahead okay well I don't know whether this needs to be a motion or it's something that can just be directed and done but where I'm going with this is I think it would be good if our materials made it front and center so that everyone could see, again, without us weighing it, because we're not the legislators, um, to make the decision whether that's the appropriate you know, thing to do under the law, but so that everybody can see it every step along the way. This is how much this is costing. Again, when those projects are bid and when the consent agenda item comes before you, those numbers are part of the attachment. So they are already a matter of the public record and they're part of the vote for a project that is bid side by side. So the public already has access to that information via the agenda item that's publicly you know, posted, advertised, et cetera. I'm not sure to, to what extent we could further elaborate upon that. Well, what, what we could but do. We can certainly work with the superintendent to, to further that. Well, what we could do, and th again, this is just a matter of making things a little bit more user friendly, and you know, um, if it's possible. So I'm looking at a sheet of paper that has, you know, for example, a total all categories, 216 million dollars. What I'm proposing is that all of these sheets of paper would reflect, okay, 216 million dollars, you know, under um, the prevailing wage requirement. Here's what we estimate it would be without that. So that would be presumably 13.6 percent less. Ms. Birch. Um, I'll have another question in a minute, but this is in re relation to what he's talking about. Um, I mean, I think that it would be m make more sense to do it on the contracts themselves rather than the proposed budget because the proposed budget uses the state, um, the state mandated per square foot dollar amount. So you know, you, you don't necessarily change it based on, you know, whether you're using prevailing wage or not. But I, I wouldn't object to seeing on the cover sheets for contracts for capital budget items, I understand that it's in the backup information, but seeing something that says, um, you know, like a separate line, and I know we have lots of lines already, but a separate line that says, you know, under um, prevailing wage, this contract w would be X under, if it were not under prevailing wage, it would be, it, if there's some way to do something like that. Is that right, cut? Yeah, just a little yeah. bit more user I, I don't know right. that the right. budget itself is the place to do that, but I think maybe individual contracts that are let, it would make sense to do it there, because some contracts would be covered by by this and some wouldn't and so it might not be the whole school it might just be portions of the school so um, that that would be my suggestion if we could ask the superintendent and his staff to look into how to add an item just for clarification for the public well, my understanding is that those contracts that is applicable is already there right so that information that goes to the board and then is posted publicly that information on prevailing wage versus non is there correct it is it is in the backup material that's all okay. publicly disclosed. I believe Ms. Burge is, is, is asking that we add it to the to narrative the on the yellow sheet. And I think we can work with the person division in your office sure. to sort of highlight that further. I like Ms. Burge's idea. If I could just go one step further, what I would like, again, just to make it a little bit more user friendly, so when we're at the end of the entire budget process, whatever number gets approved, finally approved, 
that number has next to it, right next to it, so everybody can see it, what that number would be if we did not have that prevailing wage requirement. And that would just re require tallying up all those contracts, the delta between them. That's, that's where I'm going with this. To, to, you, you know, I guess what I'm saying is the capital is not going to sit down and count up all these contracts and figure out, well, we, we know the delta for this particular school is $10 million. What I'm saying is, as part of our function, I would like to be able to present that number so that the capital can put that out there and so that citizens can see that. And if citizens agree with it, they can say, hey, we think that's great. If they disagree with it, then they can call up their delegate and say, hey, what's going on here? We're paying $50 million for this school, and we should only be paying $44 million for this school. That, that, that's all I'm saying. So your idea, just which was an improvement on mine, just one more step so that the aggregate is there at the end. I, I, I think, though, that would be a post-contract exercise, not a right, budget that's exercise. That's fine. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we were distinguishing between the two, because you kept saying on the budget you would want it presented. But it's when you budget, you haven't let the contract yet, so you don't know yet what those bids are. So it would have to be after every contract had been let, then you could say, here are our final results on such and such a school. But you couldn't do it prior because you don't know exactly yet. So I, I, that's why I think that, you know, perhaps, you know, the superintendent and his staff can work and come back to us maybe with how they think they could best present this information to um, help make the public more aware of what the costs are and what the implications of existing law are. And to clarify something that you said, Alex, for many, many, con not every single contract in a school construction project falls under prevailing wage. It's only certain amounts. Correct. It's, it, it's only applicable to certain elements of projects. Uh, and clearly, if it's a locally funded project, it's not applicable at all. So. It's uh, select elements of state eligible funded projects. So, so the entire, say a school is fifty million dollars. Not all fifty million of that falls under prevailing wage. So it would be portions. So correct. So, for example, uh, planning, design activities, furniture, fixtures, equipment activities, uh, testing, inspection activities. There's a lot of elements of a project that prevailing wage does not apply to. Okay. So, uh, Ms. Birch. Okay, on a different subject. <laughs> Um, I have a question about the the old mill series of projects. Um, I know that really getting started on these, I believe, is somewhat dependent upon the purchase of additional property so that we can start moving the schools. Um, can you tell me about the status of the purchase of Papa John's farm by the county is has that gone through yet or are we still waiting for that to be finalized we're waiting on it to be finalized the, okay. it's it's under final essentially final legal review uh, okay. once that is done the property closes and then is recorded in the land records of the county is there an anticipation as to when that might be and how sure we are that it will happen <laughs> They're actively pursuing it, and I would I would believe it will be imminent. I don't have an exact date, okay. but it's it's really down to the final uh, legal nuances. Okay, but so a lot of the things on this on this budget are dependent upon the county acquiring that property on our behalf. Correct, but remember the budget will come back to you uh, in December when the superintendent uh, presents his combined operating and capital budget, and I would certainly anticipate there would be specificity to your question by that point in time. Thank you. Are there any other board questions or comments? All right, all those in favor? All right, motion passes 9-0. Okay. Item 6.03 is the um, FY 2018 comprehensive maintenance plan this is an information to action item do i have a motion to move this from information to action all those in favor okay dr arlotto your recommendation yes ma'am i recommend board approval of the fiscal year 2018 comprehensive maintenance plan okay. so second okay all right are there any board questions or comments I had a question. How many underground tanks do we still have in our schools? 
Just because underground tanks. Yes, because it mentioned something here about the maintenance of underground tanks. So. Certainly. For, again, for the record, Alex Chuck, no, I don't have an exact number at hand, but uh, you know, the board members simply need to realize that the vast majority of the county actually does not have public gas service. Um, many of our peninsulas do not have even gas lines run down them by bg &E, et cetera. So, um, you know, where we have the opportunity to run on natural gas, we do, um, but it simply does not exist in in large swaths of the county. In in those locations, uh, for example, South County, there's no gas service anywhere down in, down in my half of the world. Uh, so we have to run on uh, number two fuel every, everywhere there. No, and I also ask because I know in the renovation of Maryland Hall, we are basically running the line so that for regular gas so that right. we can just update Maryland Hall. Right, so where we have the opportunity, once yeah. gas service becomes available and we have a project, et cetera, we are migrating towards natural gas over time as opportunities present themselves. But until the utility supplier continues to build out their network, uh, we simply don't have that opportunity until the line finally, you know, passes our property and then we can look to access that. Thank you, Alex. Mr. Reinhardt. Thank you. Uh, so in reviewing the report, uh, I noticed on page 12 of the report, uh, the Preventative Maintenance Office since its inception in 1994 has undergone a 58% reduction in staff leaving equipment at risk of increased maintenance needs in the future. Uh, just to help me better understand, what have been some of the leading causes to that reduction in staff? Budget cuts. <laughs> Budget cuts and decisions by this Board of Education over two decades to continue to prioritize positions in the schoolhouse, the teacher, the workforce, et cetera. Uh, over other positions. So. Uh, in, in, in your opinion, uh, by increasing that staff uh, in the preventative maintenance office, uh, how would that uh, better be able to address our maintenance backlog? What it does is it allows the uh, preventive maintenance activities, things like lubrication, belt changes, filter changes, et cetera, to happen on a more timely basis, which would extend the life of equipment. So if you have a piece of equipment that uh, is expected to last 15 years, for example. Uh, if you if you have a robust preventive maintenance program and you treat it well, you can have that 15-year piece of equipment actually last 17, 18, 19. You get more years of life out of it. Uh, if you don't perform the requisite uh, preventive maintenance activities, then you are at risk to that piece of equipment having a shorter life than it would have otherwise been anticipated to have had. So that's, that's the correlation between uh, longev expected longevity of an asset versus the preventive maintenance regime applied against it. All right, thank you. And in terms of employees, uh, how many people does that 58% represent? So there's, on the uh, preventive maintenance team, there's currently 21 individuals, so it's essentially it would be a doubling of that. Okay. Thank you. As, as we move ahead and, and uh, consider the overall budget, that'll be an important consideration, certainly. Uh, and I just, uh, just want to make sure I'm, I'm reading this correctly. Uh, this is my first time through uh, one of these budgets. Am I correct in, in reading that uh, in, in the last fiscal year, Oh, I'm sorry, on page seven, page seven of the report that in the last fiscal year, uh, we requested seven million to address the backlog and uh, we were only funded at four million to address the backlog? Correct. And we're working with a $160 million backlog? No, sir. Um, okay. $326,612,800 backlog. So $4 million. Uh, just, just to humor me, how many years would it take at that current level of funding? <laughs> so that's not the only dollars that apply to it. Is uh, their funding schedule there on page seven? All of those dollars collectively are applied against it, not simply maintenance backlog. The maintenance backlog item tackles uh, projects, for example, that are ineligible for state 
funding. So you'll see just on that same funding schedule, you'll see a little further down something called, for example, uh, uh, facility system component replacement as a $20 million request. That's a combination uh, of state and about 12 million from the county and 8 million from the state. So we have w more than one funding source applied towards helping us uh, eradicate that backlog. Uh, and do we have an anticipated date of when we would actually break even? Um, Decades. Likely that would not occur. Again, you know, the, the physical infrastructure continues to age and our capital reinvestment into our facilities uh, does not equal the, the rate of expiration or deterioration of facilities. So year over year, the backlog continues to increase. So for example, the, back, the calculated backlog this year is about 5.8% larger than it was at this time last year. So even that 7 million that was requested uh, is still a very conservative number. So ideally, uh, what should we be requesting year over year to address that backlog? Well, again, we're, we're sort of addressing it in, in various different fashions, but if you're looking to eradicate it in 10 years, which essentially it's a 10-year it's a plan, it'll be one-tenth of 326 million, so about 32.6 million. Ms. Birch. And so if the backlog continues to increase then by five to 7% or whatever a year, that 10% amount would also need to increase by five. So if it's 32.6 million this year that we need, next year we'd need 32.6 plus Five percent. It, it wouldn't be a constant over the ten years, That's correct. because more likely than not, the backlog is growing by a certain percentage each right. year. But again, remember that there's a lot of things that work against the backlog. So, for example, we just recently opened Savannah Park High School, so all of the backlog that had built up as part of that school disappeared. Got zeroed out by the mm -hmm. replacement school that was put in its place. So, but despite that, we still have a five percent bigger backlog. Correct. So, if we hadn't built Severna Park, it would have increased by a lot more. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So it's always again, you know, we've got a capital program and we're trying to tackle it from various, various aspects, and it's always a, a combination of ensuring that you know we continue to take care of our uh, aging fleet of infrastructure continue to address our capacity concerns, continue to update our buildings programmatically uh, so that they can support today's educational delivery model. So it's always a very delicate balancing act about how we deploy our resources. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Nally. <clears throat> I think Mr. Reinhardt touched on something that we've talked about for a long time, and that is uh, the ability to, and you years ago, I remember some things you say, Alex, uh, said as if you had your own home and you have a roof and you don't do any repairs or you have whatever. And, and then you have to, that, that becomes a big problem. If you're able to have the personnel other than the 21 folks, if you're able to have that, you could do some preventive maintenance as we all do on our homes and, and businesses and whatever. We have been unable to do that, which, has really made this backlog, I think, in my years on the board, go up more quickly. Am I, is that a fair assumption? No, it is, because again, the, you know, the very definition of a backlog, essentially, Ms. Nally, is that, you know, you've got a, you've got a series of work that you should have accomplished this year, but because of fiscal constraints or other forces, you didn't eradicate that entire list, you eradicated some portion of the list. The unaccomplished or incomplete element then rolls forward to next year. But next year, you already had a list that was due next year as well. So now it's next year's list plus the incompleted portion of the current year. So that's how a backlog over time continues to grow unless you can fully address it each and every fiscal year. The incomplete portion continues to roll forward. And, and you're right, it has continued to increase substantively uh, over your tenure here on this Board of Education. Mr. Reinhardt. Uh, thank you for helping me with that clarification, Ms. Nally. Um, so as, as we, we just looked at the capital improvement plan for construction of new schools, uh, does this uh, maintenance, comprehensive maintenance plan that we have in front of us, does it take into account 
uh, some of that backlog being eliminated by proposed new school construction? It does. Each and every year it's recalibrated to remove the, the liabilities associate, associated with those buildings that we've uh, now completed and have been taken off the rolls. So that $326 million already took into account all the new construction? Correct. Okay. Switching gears to a different percent. Uh, on pages 13 and 14 of the report, uh, I read that uh, Energy Conservation Division remotely programs the scheduled start-stop times and operates heating and cooling equipment to maintain proper temperature set points according to building occupancy and after-school activity requests at approximately 98% of our schools, done by internet connections to central monitoring office. Uh, what's preventing us from getting to 100%? Essentially, they're the schools that are uh, remaining in a capital program, so it would make no sense to, in to install an expensive energy management system into a building that we're about ready to undergo a, a comprehensive renovation replacement. So a school like Rolling Knowles, for example, we don't have that uh, connectivity. We've not made that investment because we know, hopefully, in another year or two, we're going to be tearing that building down. So. That number has continued to. I'm sorry, Rippling Woods. <laughs> Rippling Woods, not Rolling Knolls. Uh, so that 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 number has continued to grow. So you know, with the accomplishment of the capital program, we're going to be at 100 percent. All right. Thank you. So when I look on page seven at the all the various sources that are used to to handle maintenance, it's about 32.1 million, which is close to that 32.6 to eradicate in 10 years, but doesn't take into account the growth each year for that. So we're making progress, but not enough. Right. But again, on the capital budget that you just approved, for mm -hmm. example, uh, we are asking in that maintenance uh, backlog category, that was the funded element. So in the maintenance backlog category, we're actually asking for 7 million, not four. So we are requesting monies to try to, to bridge that gap to be able to structurally keep up with it. So your, you know, your position in a, in a manner that I think we're requesting a, a fairly um, reasonable amount of funding, the question is how will the chips fall out when the appropriation authority is granted? So, so yes, so we've been requesting the amount to, to handle this backlog in 10 years and carry and with some of the increase, but we have not been funded for that amount. Is it correct? Okay. All right. Are there any further board questions or comments? Okay. Um, are there? Is there any public comment? Okay. All those in favor? Motion passes nine zero. Thank you very much. All right. Item 6.044 is the Maryland City Kindergarten Edition. This is an information to action item. Do I have a motion to move this item from information to action? Second. All those in favor? Okay. Dr. Arlotto, your recommendation. Yes, ma'am. I'd recommend board approval of the Maryland City Elementary School Kindergarten Edition schematic design. Second. All right. Are there any board questions or comments? I actually have one. With this, how many kindergartens do we have left that still need a kindergarten addition? Well, with this one, we have 51 complete, seven under construction, five under design for 63, and then we have three in the six-year plan, 13 remaining. 13 remain. So this goes back to what year was it passed that required that we go to all day kindergarten? It, it was passed in the 0405 legislative cycle and the mandate was to have them uh, in place by the 0708 academic year. And so we've had full day kindergarten since 2007, but we are still working to provide the space needed. So we still have 13 schools that need to have. So Ms. Nally, you had asked about the open closure schools and you hope those were done before you're gone, and I'm going to hope that before I'm gone, we can get all these kindergartens, but I will see how that works out. What? And then, and then we'll have to be adding on pre-K additions, so <laughs> it will <laughs> never end. All right. Is there any public comment on this? All right. All those in favor? All right. Motion passes 9-0.
Item 6.05 is an information to action item. Um, the Maryland Open Meetings Act trainee designation. Do I have a motion to move this from information to action? Second. All those in favor? Okay. Um, just, I'm gonna read this. I'm, I'm gonna read this first. So, during the 2017 legislative session, the Maryland General Assembly passed legislation subsequently signed into law by Governor Larry Hogan that requires at least one member of a public body to take a training class focused on the Maryland Open Meetings Act. The designee must be named by the public body by October 1st, 2017, and must participate in a training class within 90 days after designation. Public bodies that do not designate a representative on or before October 1st, 2017 would not be able to meet in executive session. Mr. Gilliland. Thank you, Madam President. I move that Mrs. Burge be the designated representative of this board. Okay. Um, are there any board questions or comments about this? Okay. Do you want me to talk now or after the Whichever you want to do. What do you think? Okay, so all those in favor of naming Ms. Burge as our Open Meetings Act designee? Okay, motion passes, 9-0. So, Burge. Thank you. Um, so, this is not a um, glamorous job. It just means that I was available last Thursday to go to the training prior to the October 1st deadline. Um, so, the, the act requires that um, at least one member of every public body undergo this training. Um, there are several ways to get the training. One is a very short online um, course that is not necessarily relevant to school boards. You can also get it through the Maryland Municipal League, which I'm hoping is what cities and towns do, through MAKO, which I'm hoping is what the counties do, and now MABE is an authorized provider, our Association of Boards of Education. So I went to MABE last Thursday and had a very thorough training on um, what the Open Meetings Act requires, the changes that have been made to it recently. You know, I've been through Open Meetings Act trainings before, but this is the only one that counted legally. Um, and I, I basically, it is incumbent upon us to police ourselves, um, which is what the new law requires. And so I'm gonna be for now the person, we will probably have more designees who, after other people take the training, um, but for now it's me. It was an excellent training. It thoroughly covered everything we need to know from whether something um, is a meeting at all to whether it can legally be closed for certain things. Um, and if I am ever not here at a meeting, then we have to fill out a, a form required by um, the state. And all of those items will, would be public record as part of the minutes. So um, I don't know if any of my colleagues have questions about the training I underwent. I, I know that a few people are thinking about going in November to the MABE training, um, or we may try and get some training here for ourselves. Thank you, Ms. Burge. So that concludes the um, the agenda items, Mr. Gilliland. Thank you again, Madam President. I move that the board go into closed session to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. Second. All those in favor? Okay, we are now going to closed session. The next me board meeting will be held Wednesday, October 18th at 7 p.m. The next board policy committee meeting is Wednesday, October 11th at 1 p.m. in conference room 2A of the Parham Building. The next board budget committee meetings um, is today, September 20th, one hour after the board meeting ends, and then Wednesday, October 18th at 5 p.m. We are now adjourned.